Hello, and welcome to the Freedom from the Struggle podcast. I'm Anthony. I'm Melissa. And we are so glad that you've joined us for tonight's episode, season two, episode 17. And we have a, I would say fun, but also informative episode lined up for you tonight. We are actually going to cover the topic of cryptozoology as it pertains to the paranormal, as well as some of our concepts of some of the more biblical reasons maybe for these hybrid creatures that may exist on earth with us at this time. But before we get to that, what I want to do is do uh, just a couple of announcements. Just want to remind you that you can also always find us on the socials by looking for Freedom from the Struggle. So at Facebook, Instagram, we uh, also have a Patreon campaign where you can go to patreon.com forward slash freedom from the struggle. There are two levels of support for us on Patreon. At the $2 level, you get uh, the back catalog as well as the episode uh, for the week a day earlier. And at the $5 level, you are able to access the two bonus episodes a month that we put out where we cover some adjunctive topics. And so please look for us there. Make sure you like, subscribe, as well as uh, friend us on any of those socials. It just helps us grow and it helps us to get our message out there. And we're going to start doing a lot more on the socials in terms of just more posting and things like that. So you'll be able to get ideas of kind of what we're doing behind the scenes, as well as in some of our episodes, you may see us post pictures or other adjunctive, again, information that go with the episode for that week. So be looking out for that. We hope you can join us there. Now, tonight's topic is one that came up in our conversations with Melissa and I, and one of the things that we will do sometimes in our daily life is we'll watch some paranormal programming, and Melissa's kind of adopted this as one of her new (laughs) hobbies because of me. Now, I do want to say that I I get slack a lot because I'm a, a retired minister, somebody who's done deliverance ministry for decades. And I am always kind of criticized sometimes by Christians that I'm too obsessed with this topic or that I shouldn't be watching paranormal programming. But I want to kind of give you a background. I'm somebody who's been able to see demons since my earliest memories. My literal earliest memories as a human being are seeing evil entities in my life. We found out later in life that these entities may have been welcomed in by by previous family members or their familiar spirits. Not really 100% sure where those things were, but we think we have a good grasp of why I was seeing these things as a young child. So this topic has been something that I have studied out of not only my own background, but also in some of my religious studies. I've gone to a lot of Bible college, seminary, that type of thing. And it's always been a topic of mine because When you help people who are struggling with the paranormal, you have to kind of know what's out there. So sometimes we'll watch things that are very intense, but one of the things that Melissa and I like to watch is a program called These Woods Are Haunted. And it's a program that you could find on Discovery Plus. I'm not sure the original network that these started to air on um, some of the Discovery Discovery Plus networks have all merged together, but I'm not sure if it was originally on True TV or if it was on the Travel Channel. But if you have Discovery Plus, you can simply do a search and find the three seasons of this program. Now, why I like this is because there's a lot of lore and a lot of, I guess, stories that come out of people being out in the woods Mm -hmm. and seeing the many things that could be seen, Bigfoot, Dogman, hauntings, stumbling upon rituals occurring out in the woods, haunted houses that are stuck out in the middle of nowhere, haunted cabins. And I think that if you did a search, you could probably find thousands of stories about paranormal activity that has occurred out in the woods. Now, I personally have a belief that Because demons are everywhere roaming around, they prefer the dark places, the secluded places, or maybe even places where that darkness kind of can feed their energies. 
And so I think sometimes people in the woods stumble upon these. With that being said, the topic of cryptozoology pops up because it is one where we see these hybrid creatures that, you know, pop up out of nowhere, like Bigfoot, for example. And cryptozoology, for those of you who aren't really familiar, I'm going to just give a basic definition. It's basically the study of animals or creatures that have not yet been formally kind of, I guess, exposed or formally, you know, introduced into our mainstream animal listings. So Bigfoot, for example, is something that would fall under a cryptozoological category because although hundreds and thousands of people claim to have seen them, we don't have one in captivity or we don't have a taxidermied Bigfoot standing at a museum somewhere. So it, it falls into that category. However, if you do a little bit of research, you'll find that there are cryptozoologists that are very intelligent scientists who their studies of these creatures, their goal is to eventually categorize them into the anim animal categories that we have. Now, why is this important for a paranormal podcast about demons and that type of a thing? Well, it's because of two reasons. Number one, I believe that a lot of Christians avoid this topic, and that turns off a lot of people who might be able to understand what these things are in terms of, I would say, the Christian framework, mm -hmm. because a lot of Christians, especially pastors, it's easier for them to say, well, these things don't exist, move on. But that doesn't help people who believe in these things. There has to be answers for this. And then number two, and I think may, way more important, when people see things like this, their instinct is to seek out God mm -hmm. because of the terror that's induced, right? Yeah, so exactly. when they are terrified and they come to a Christian and there's no answer, it could literally turn them to other avenues when it's a perfect, I guess, opportunity for them to understand who Jesus is. But here's the thing. If you don't understand what these are, or you as a Christian don't have a framework for these, you can literally become detrimental to these people's pursuit. Mm -hmm. And so I will be the first to say that I'm not a big cryptozoology guy, but I do have a theory that we'll talk about. So I'm going to say this so we can get to the episode. Melissa and I have a favorite paranormal episode of all time, of all the shows we've watched. <laughs> And it is from this program, season three, episode three, entitled, I think, or it's, it's entitled, I'm looking <laughs> at a bleeping werewolf. werewolf. <laughs> and um, they bleep the gentleman out because he, although it's, you know, on discovery, they don't allow profanity, but he uses the profanity. I think I'm looking at a bleeping werewolf. And when Melissa and I first watched <laughs> this episode, it was not only humorous, but it was the guy's an amazing storyteller, yes, wouldn't you yes, say? Yes, he's so funny. So I want you to do us a favor, Melissa. I want you to give us the premise as you can remember it of this episode. And we're going to actually tie this into this letter that I've received a few weeks back. So tell us about the episode. Yes. Yeah, so the episode started, I think the gentleman's name was Roy and he lived, I think in Nebraska and eventually moved to Louisiana and so he was working, um, I think he got a job at like a Gap store or like a King's, some clothing store. Um, I can't remember the exact name of the clothing store, but a very attractive guy, maybe 6'1", 6'2", you know, muscles, everything. Very, a very gentleman, very, um, the staff seems to really enjoy having him, you know, working there. And, um, so this beautiful lady walks in and so she walks up and he, she was like looking at some clothes. And then, so he said, Oh, that would look really nice on you when I pick you up to take out to dinner tonight. And the way that she kind of looked at him and while we were watching a movie, I didn't think anything of it. I thought, well, she's an attractive lady. He's an attractive gentleman. Maybe they should just go out on a date and they should have fun. And, um, but Prior to that, when he saw her and she said something like, oh, well, my mother doesn't allow boys to come to my house. And so he was thinking, well, you know, this is back in the 90s or back early 80s. Then this is kind of normal. And then he said, well, why 
you know, can we meet somewhere else? And so she told them, um, I can't remember the park that they were going to meet at. Do you remember? It was called Prospect Park, Prospect maybe. Prospect Park, something in, in uh, a little part of, I think it's called Metairie, Louisiana, Louisiana. Yeah. which is kind of just outside New Orleans. New Orleans, okay. I think he said like 20 miles outside or something. And so he said, as, as he was telling the story, as, as Anthony mentioned early, he's a great storyteller. He was just, yeah, he was a really good storyteller. And so, and he said he felt like something was off about her, but she was just so pretty that he didn't really think anything of it. And so she said, well, why don't we just meet at the park at like seven o'clock? And so fast forward, he drove about what, 20, 45 minute drive. And so he got there a little early to be a gentleman. And so he was waiting around, you know, for like, it was seven. He, I think they were supposed to meet at like seven, seven fifteen, seven thirty, seven forty-five, seven. 7 30, 7 45, 7, finally eight o'clock. And the young lady never showed up, but there was a guy they were playing basketball and he said, Hey, um, would you like to play basketball? I think he, at, when he first got there and he said, Hey, I'm waiting for someone. He said, okay. So after an hour went by, he said he was going to leave. And he said, Hey, why don't you stay and play some play basketball with us? And then these other, the original guy that was there playing basketball, his two other friends uh, showed up and then they started playing basketball. He said, well, okay, I'm here. I want to do something else, you know, just got stood up, basically. got stood up. So let me just make the best of my drive here the time, you know, cause I did drive about 45 minutes here. So they played basketball for four hours, four or five hours until it was dark at this time. But I think he said at the park that the park lights will shut off at midnight. So they had played basketball, you know, for a couple of hours and then they decided to go grab something to eat and something to drink. And then um, I'll let you pick it up from there. What what, what I want to do, <laughs> and and I'm glad that you stopped right there. Because I'm going to start laughing. I won't <laughs> be able to tell the story. Because I was going to stop you there because what I want to do is kind of leave a little suspense it's, moment. Okay. okay? <laughs> so in this story, you know, as, as we laugh about it, even though it was it's terrifying, terrifying, it's just the guy's storytelling is amazing. But what I want to do is I'm going to pause for a second. And I'm going to read a letter that I received a handful of weeks ago. And like I said, I've been kind of waiting for the opportunity of when I would discuss this topic on this podcast, because it can get pretty deep and it can get very, I would say somewhat controversial in terms of what Christians believe. But I, you know, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know that I'm going to bring the receipts, you know, I'm not just going to give you a theory that doesn't have some biblical backing. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to read this letter. It says, Hey, Anthony, my name is Anthony as well, but you can call me Tony. Uh, I just had a quick question and a quick story. I'm not sure if you touched on this or not, but what are your thoughts on cryptids, especially werewolves or dogmen? And um, let me pause for a second here before we keep going. There are, different kind of philosophies when it comes to the difference between a werewolf or a dog man. And there's a whole camp of people that will say they are completely different creatures. And then there's another camp of people that say they're the same creature, different name. And you can find this um, by studying a topic called the beast of Bray road, for example, where there's several people that have um, witness this creature. There's even books and you can go on prime video right now and probably find, you know, the beast of Bray road documentary, um, where a woman has literally written an entire book about this and then became kind of one of the foremost experts. But as far as I'm going to go with this podcast, I'm not going to get into the debate. I'm going to kind of use the terms interchangeably just for the basis of simplicity, not for the sake of trying to pick a fight between the cryptozoology people that think there's a difference mm -hmm. um, because it, it could get into, you know, a debate that doesn't need to happen for what we're doing here today. I'll continue with the letter. So this may not be the podcast for this question, but you seem open-minded to questions. So I thought I would ask, great. I'm glad you brought the question, Tony. Glad you did. Why is this important to me? Well, because in 2020, during the pandemic, I saw a dog man. I'm not sure if there's a difference between a werewolf and a dog man. So again, he's not real sure either. But from my, my research, I'm sure it was a dog man. 
So apparently Tony has done some research and according to what distinguishing factors they have out there, he considers it a dog man. I want you to know that I'm a hundred percent sure that this is what I saw. It was not a trick of the light or an overactive imagination. This is what I saw. And I think that's, I like that he put that in there because mm-hmm. we talked last week about skeptics yeah, and exactly. how they, they are constantly attacking the story, but it, it, at least in Tony's mind, he's a hundred percent sure what he saw. And, you know, I've seen things before where I've wondered if it's what I saw. And then there's mm-hmm. other times where I'm like, I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> I saw that. And so that's where he's coming from. He said, because we were locked down and that's because of the pandemic, a friend of mine asked if I wanted to go to his family cabin and just get some fresh air, take some hikes and be with nature in order to avoid getting COVID. And that was what everybody was doing at that time in 2020. I think the the pandemic started in March of 2020. So this is probably more summerish. I'm just guessing, but the cabin was huge and had a wraparound porch. It was about 15 feet above the ground in the back and overlooked the woods behind the cabin. So I'm picturing in my mind that you pull up to the cabin, but maybe it's got more of like a, it kind of hangs over in the back. So, so in the back, it's, it's not ground level, but in the front it is. And uh, it says there was a very long staircase that came from the ground up to the porch in the back. I'm assuming. My friend and I were just sitting out on the porch having a few adult beverages. I like that. And he decided to go to the restroom. It was like a movie. First, my hair stood on end and I knew something was wrong. I instantly started scanning the tree line. The moon was pretty bright so I could see quite a ways back. My eyes honed in on a creature that I guess was about seven feet tall. It was for sure a dog type creature. It was just, or it just stared at me. I could see his eyes because they were glowing yellow. It was snarling like the meanest dog you could imagine. I somehow knew that it wanted to kill me or worse. My friend came back out. And when I turned to him to tell him to look into the trees, this thing must have moved or disappeared. When we both looked in that direction, it was gone. I must have looked terrified because he didn't even doubt me. We just went inside and locked all the doors and windows. We both slept with some weapons. I had the most horrific nightmare you could imagine that night. And you can see why this reminded Mm -hmm. me of of the story we're going to get back to. But he says, needless to say, we cut our trip short and went home the next morning. I have never been back. (laughs) Let me know your thoughts on this. I am a believer, which I'm assuming means he's a Christian, and I don't feel that I can ask a lot of my Christian friends because they will probably not understand or judge me. Can't wait to hear back from, from you, Tony. So there is this idea that I, uh, I think I started the podcast with is a lot of Christians wouldn't know what to do with this because, you know, you hear even preachers talk about demons, but I wonder how many times you've ever heard a pastor do a sermon on a Bigfoot or a dog man or some sort of cryptological creature like <laughs> mm-hmm. the Chupacabra or the, you know, Loch Ness monster or something like that. Mm-hmm. They just seem to kind of shy away from it, but we are not going to do that today. So what we're going to do is now kind of take this letter and move it back towards the episode of these woods are haunted. So Roy and these guys are moving up uh, the railroad tracks because they said it's the fastest way to get to the, I think they were going to the liquor store is what they originally said and maybe get some food. And uh, Roy goes out of his way to say that it was so dark because the trees started to close in. in. Mm -hmm. So the more they got down the railroad tracks, the more that it wasn't wide open, there's trees on both sides. And he hears a growl or a snarl like this guy, like Mm -hmm. Tony says in this letter. And they are trying to figure out what it is because you can't see five feet in front of you. So they're all kind of huddled together or they literally lose sight of each other. And so Herman, the gentleman who he was playing basketball with, and he names him by name, he says Herman falls to the ground when they all kind of try to start to run. 
And so because they didn't want to leave him, they all kind of turned around. And this is where me and Melissa will laugh every time. But he says that when they came back up onto Herman, standing over the top of him was a female werewolf. Right. And that's where he gets the term, I'm looking at a bleeping werewolf. And if you watch the episode, and, and I would encourage you to do so because you'll crack up. I mean, because he's a real guy telling a real story, you can tell. And that's what a real guy would have said. And he you can tell in his eyes that he was telling the truth. I mean, he was still terrified. Like you can. Yeah. And this was, I think he was 19 at 1981. the time. 1981. Uh-huh. So that's, I mean, 40, 40 years, years ago. ago? Yeah. <laughs> So, so he is telling this story and he sees this werewolf and they, they're not sure, uh, what, the, what they're going to do. But one of the friends of Herman had a pistol and as they're scanning, Roy goes on to describe the creature having the genitalia of a female. So he knew it was a female werewolf. Um, and so in my mind, and, and tell me if I'm crazy, but in my mind, I pictured that this must have human-like characteristics Features, Yeah. because if a dog was standing on its hind legs or a wolf, you know, unless you saw, you know, like that she was feeding cubs, cubs. Mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to distinguish whether it was a male or a female in the dark. But if she had like human-like genitalia, but had a dog face werewolf style, then that's how he knew it was a female. And so he, you know, they shoot at this thing, apparently hit it. So it takes off running. But remember the one section that really intrigued me was when I think the creature started like growling and like making these really, he said that he has never heard a sound like that before and never again, but how it was able to, because when his friend fell, Herman fell on his back. So the creature was standing over him. And he said the creature was about nine feet tall, maybe 250 pounds. I mean, it was, she was pretty big. And after all of it, then the other two friends came back. So they were all standing there just looking at this creature. And Herman was still on the ground, did not say a word. He was just frozen in fear. And then that creature just stopped growling and snarling and stop making all those noises she was just staring at Herman on the ground and not looking at any of the other three guys just staring at how it could change and control I guess their I wouldn't say emotions because I mean you know it could maybe be, it could yeah. be but okay so and and, <laughs> and I, I didn't notice that and I'm glad you brought that up that's not something that caught my attention but I think it is important because you know, it, 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 that's more of a human characteristic. Yeah, is what yeah, you're yeah, saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas an, a true animal well, would just, just be on the hunt. Mm -hmm. It would not stop. stop. It would, you know, and, and it kind was of staring right into yeah. the, the Herman's eyes and he was just frozen in fear. Yeah. And if, and if an animal chased you and caught you, it's just going to go to work <laughs> and, but it didn't seem to do that. So I'm, I, I, that's a good catch. So Roy basically describes how he runs and keep in mind, he has to go back to his car that's at prospect park. And then he's got to drive 20 some miles away, 40 minutes away. And he stated that when he got to his place, he locked the doors that he lived in terror and that he was having nightmares that he, he would be, you know, the thing would rip his arms off. It would attack him. And it, it took him several years and some kind of help from a friend to be able to compartmentalize mm -hmm. this event to where he doesn't live with it. But he was saying like, picture in your mind, like every time you close your eyes, that's what you see. And sometimes you even see it in your daydreams. Like he couldn't stop living with it. And so what happened is. Wait, he was so terrified that happened on the Saturday. He did not leave his house until that Tuesday, Tuesday yeah. till it was time for him to go to work. Exactly. That's how terrified he was. Exactly. So when he did go back to work, his boss kind of saw that there was something wrong with him. And she's the one that because they're in New Orleans, that she stated that he saw a loop guru or what some people call a root guru, um, which is kind of that that uh, 
I think it's a Creole term or a French term for a werewolf. And when she told him that it made sense to him what he was dealing with, because, you know, this wasn't a concept the guy from, you know, Nebraska would know about, but these people down in the swamps in new Orleans, they know exactly what a loop guru or a root guru is. And <laughs> he put two and two together that the female that came into the shop, clothes shopping had kind of sized him up and basically was setting him up to attack him. Yeah. He said that was her next meal. Yeah. She came into said. the store. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and so that's his belief. Now, wh when you, and you, you hear us laughing, even though this probably shouldn't be a funny topic be yeah. because the guy's story, the guy's story is so humorous. And, and when I tell you this guy, I would, I would listen to this guy tell stories all day. That's why I think <laughs> it's so funny, but his story in and of itself is tragic because he literally describes how this thing haunted him for years, years and, and years and years. And so I would imagine Tony feels the same way mm -hmm. because his event, you know, as he's writing, you know, just four years later, four ish years later, you know, it's still probably very vivid in his mind. And who do you go to talk to about this? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of give you some theology here. And if you've listened to this podcast, you may hear some overlap, but I, I definitely want to make sure that we have the ability to kind of give you Christian believers, maybe a view that you don't hear often in terms of theology about demons in general. Now, what I could easily do is go, well, these things are demons and next story, you know, I could easily mm -hmm, do that, yeah. but I don't want to do that because I want to give you some theology. Okay. So the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter six, that there were these angels that were sent down from heaven to watch over the earth. They were called the watchers. They were to basically teach humans how to live and, and kind of be an intermediary between them and God, because, uh, Adam and Eve had sinned in the garden and God had removed his presence from where they were. So they were no longer walked with God on the earth. They had to have you know, kind of a more distant relationship, but the God loved him so much that he sent these watcher angels. But we also learn in the Bible that these angels went rogue and they took human women and created these hybrid offspring called the Nephilim. Now this can get very complicated because some people considered it as simple as these angels were able to have sex with human women. And some people can take it a set, uh, like a whole step or 10 deeper and say that there was some sort of ritualistic kind of supernatural way that they had these offspring, but we don't know for sure. What we do know is we can gather a little more information from some adjunctive books to the Bible. And one of those is the book of Enoch or the book of first Enoch to be more specific. Now I will debate with Christians all day long. I am not somebody who believes that Enoch should have been in the Bible or in what they call the canon. It didn't make it to the canon. And we can have a zillion debates about how, you know, the wrong humans were making these decisions at these councils on what should be in Christ scripture, Christian scripture, what shouldn't be. I believe that the Holy Spirit had a whole lot more to do with that than the humans could really mess that up. But I do believe that the book of Enoch is important more of like a commentary or like a junctive work because it talks about what happened with these angels, with these watchers and what happened with these Nephilim. And so I would encourage everybody to read the book of Enoch, but you know, don't put it on the same level of scripture, but it can give you a bigger perspective. And a lot of people will say, well, that, you know, we're not sure of the authorship and that's why it didn't make cool. But I can tell you this, there are quotes from the book of Enoch in scripture. And I heard a, a preacher that I really, really love and respect that was trying to say that there's not direct quotes from Enoch, that it's just us reading into stuff. If you read the book of Jude, there is a direct quote, quote from Enoch. So, you know, I think a lot of Christians want to shy away from this topic is what I'm saying, and I'm not gonna. So when these rogue angels came, God sent a flood. 
But when you hear the storytelling in Genesis 6, it says there were Nephilim in those days and also after the flood. Now, if that's the case and God wiped out every living creature on earth that didn't make it onto the ark, how did we get these beings reintroduced? Now, I'm going to give you a couple of things that maybe you Christians haven't considered. And Melissa, I want you to kind of tell me, because we didn't really talk about this before the episode, if you've ever heard this before. We have been told through storytelling, and especially if you've been to like uh, little vacation Bible schools and stuff like that when you were a little kid, Mm -hmm. singing the Jesus Loves Me song in, in, you know, kids church, we were told that Noah went out and grabbed two of each animal and brought them on the ark. But that's not true. Two of each animal came to the ark. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that important? Because if you read some of these adjunctive texts, you realize that these angels were not just reproducing with humans. They were creating hybrid animals as well. And so the reason, see see, see how you're looking at me like that? (laughs) So uh, the reason that that's important is God chose to bring two of each animal that he considered to still have normal Mm -hmm. genealogy or DNA that he had designed. God's purpose of the flood was to wipe out this tainted DNA. Mm -hmm. Now you can get crazy if you want to, because if you take the dating methods that we use out of science, which people will try to argue how accurate it is. And other people will argue that it's not accurate anywhere near what they think it is. And I lean more towards the latter myself. But if you take all the dating out, this would explain things like a woolly mammoth or like a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. You know, well, the dinosaur were 160 million years ago. Well, if the dating's right, but if the dating's not right, then, you know, these could be some of these hybrid creatures, not just hybrid human beings called Nephilim, Mm -hmm. but they can also be hybrid animals as well. Now, again, that's a whole other 10 podcasts, so I don't (laughs) want to spend too much time on there, but I don't want to minimize it because I might get some of you a little riled up. But let's say, for example, a saber-toothed tiger was not the original design from God, but these watcher angels were doing these grotesque things, we'll call it, and creating these hybrid creatures. God didn't want those preserved. And I, you know, uh, Uh, one of the major things that people will say to Christians is, well, the Noah's Ark story is obviously garbage because how could he put two of every species, every animal on planet earth? Because there's what, eight zillion species and they find 10 more every day type thing. But you wouldn't need a wolf, a coyote, a Pomeranian, a, a pit bull like the one laying on my foot right now, mm-hmm. uh, or a or a Maltese like laying on the back of my ankle right now. <laughs> you would just need two canines. Yep. And those canines can walk off of that arc and begin to reproduce and create several dif- different types of canine. Mm-hmm. So it wouldn't take eight zillion animals. Some people say that it wasn't the animals themselves; it was the DNA. And who knows? Maybe it was. But here's what I'm getting at. If that existed before, and then we find out that these Nephilim existed after the flood, you have to start to develop a theology, Christians, on what you believe. Because if if you don't have a theology, are you saying that these Bible stories aren't true? And if you're saying that, then why are you a Christian? Because you can't just say, well, I don't believe 90% of the Bible, but I believe this. The Bible says that it's literally God-breathed scriptures given to us. So why would God go out of his way to have his writers of the Bible tell us of these creatures like these giants? Well, I'm going to take you to a guy by the name of King Og of Bashan. Now, why is King Og important to this story? Because King Og, when they went to destroy him, 
and Moses, um, you know, was conquering lands as, you know, as it pertains to God, getting them to their promised land. The, the followers of Moses, which became the Hebrew people, were out in pursuit and literally overtook the kingdom of Og. But when they found Og's bed, it was enormous. Now, why is that important? Because this bed was supposedly like 13 feet by 13 feet. And if you consider most estimates of what these giants look like, like Goliath was probably nine feet, nine inches tall, give or take, excuse me, <clears throat> give or take nine feet, nine inches tall, Og was probably bigger than that. And so a lot of people focus on, you know, how tall he is or the bed being so tall, but not a lot of people stop and consider, was this an actual bed or what it, was it a ritualistic bed? And there's many people that believe that Og was in the process of creating Nephilim, creating these hybrid creatures through these rituals. And man, we can get very complicated in terms of were, the, were there another group of angels that came down after the Watchers and were reproducing again with the humans and creating, you know, the King Ogs of the world? Or did the spirits of the Nephilim who were cursed to roam the earth because they don't have their bodies anymore, but they possessed the knowledge of their fathers, which were these watchers. And this knowledge included all of these supernatural things outside of our grasp in the universe. And we're teaching them. And these Kings began to have rituals where they can create not only large people, but again, what were they doing with the animals? Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to ask you, Melissa, because, you know, again, we didn't really discuss this before, but have you ever heard a preacher or anybody in your life talk about any of this before? No, I have not. <laughs> so from, I just remember as a very young girl, I grew up as a Baptist and I was probably maybe about 10, nine, eight, something like that. And we, I'll never forget this. We watched a movie and it was teaching us, you know, to be a, you know, a good Christian or a good person, you know, do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? And it was showing us what hell would look like if you went to hell. And it was a movie of just people living their normal lives or, um, like there was one scene of a guy riding a motorcycle and then he just, he had a really bad accident and he died and he went to hell and it just kind of gave a, it was like a movie of what happens when you go to hell with the devils and the demons and the fire. And it's just a constant that that's what you're going to live. That's what you're going to feel or go through while you're in hell versus, you know, going to heaven and eating cotton candy and popcorn. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> Uh, but come to find out, they went back and they did a clip on this guy. He was a very bad person. Like he killed four or five people. He was a big bully. He would intimidate, you know, women and beat up women and like rob banks and things like that. So it was just kind of that movie. But I think that's the only memory that I have of hearing. And I've been to, you know, a couple of churches just trying to find out, you know, where I fit. And I've never heard them mention anything about, you know, they'll say, oh, that's just the devil or the demons, but never gone into details like you have. Or so I'm learning a lot from you as the listeners are learning as well. Well, and 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 I appreciate you telling that because I'm in no way trying to break my own arm to pat myself on the back. I am actually trying to motivate Christians to really put their mind to this because mm -hmm. if you're noticing our world today, there is a lot more discussion of these types of topics. And it's, it's very curious to me because never in this point in my life, I mean, we get attacked by atheists. I don't know, at least three times a day here, but I would say that the vast majority of majority of people that we interact with or people that we interact with, even in public believe in something. They may not believe in Jesus as God, but they believe in 
a werewolf or a Bigfoot or some sort of cryptid or some sort of paranormal entity or mm -hmm. aliens. And Christians really need to have a framework on what they believe, because what if you're, you have somebody who comes to you and says, here's what I'm struggling with. I live out in the woods and about three nights a week, this creature comes into my backyard. It's killed my dog. Uh, my wife had to run from the car to the house the other night. I don't know what to do. And if you don't have at least a basic framework to discuss these topics, and, and I'm going to say this and it's harsh, but I'm going to say it. You're worthless to that person mm -hmm. because they're looking for answers. And if they know you're a Christian and they're coming to you for that type of an answer, and your answer is, well, I don't believe in that, which you please don't do that. But if your answer is, I don't really know, then you're not going to get, you're not going to be of help to them. Now, the vice versa is true. You can say, well, it's just a demon and you have to pray. Well, that could be true, but it's way too simplistic. Mm -hmm. But imagine if you said, okay, so what did the creature look like? Well, it looked like a, like it was standing on its hind legs and it was about seven feet tall and it had the face of a dog, but it had like eyes of a human. It looked very human-like. It moved almost like it was very natural walking on two legs. And it was growling at me. And I felt it before I saw it. Now, is this a demon? You know, here's, here's basically your options. It's either one of these hybrid creatures, which is evil. Mm -hmm. It's either a demon that has possessed an animal which is also evil. And that can happen by the way, or it is, um, you know, an actual demon manifestation itself. And you're seeing more of a truer form of what a demon looks like versus the typical shadowy kind of wispy black smoke that mm -hmm. flies by you out of the corner of your eye. Now ask me which one I believe. And I would say that depends. But I would say in this story of, of Roy on These Woods Are Haunted, as well as Tony's story, I would say that it's more than likely one of these hybrid creatures that roams the earth somewhere. And Roy even said at the, at the end of the, the episode that he's like, it's evil, it's the devil, it's something wicked, you know, yeah. it's not natural. This is from the devil, it's not from the devil. Yeah. And, and, and so I believe that now, why, why do I believe that in these cases? Well, let me, let me give you an answer. There are countless people, for example, that have seen a dog man or a werewolf countless. Now let's just say there's just for a round number, let's pick a thousand. There's more than that, but let's pick a thousand. Let's say half of them misidentified a, a wolf that just happened to be on its hind legs because it was trying to eat a squirrel out of a tree. Let's just take half of them and throw them away. So you have 500 sightings and let's say half of those people were drunk or high. So you still got 250 to explain. And what are these people seeing and why is there no evidence of them? Well, what other people would say was, well, now those 250 left are mental illness. But that can't be the case because when you start to vet who these people are, these are some of them very normal people, professionals, mm -hmm. law enforcement officers, park rangers, people that like a park ranger is always a good credible witness to me <laughs> yes. because they know everything Thanks. about the woods. They know what a bear looks like when it walks on its hind legs. They know what it sounds like. They know what it smells like. They know mm -hmm. what deer that have mange or, or, you know, other things that deer can have, you know, diseases and such. They know what coyotes sound like and what animals sound like when they're mating. So when they see something that they are terrified of, these people walk through the woods by themselves, yeah. drive through the darkest places in the world fearlessly when these people tell a story, it's something worth paying attention to. And a lot of these witnesses are this. In the, in, I used the Beast of Bray Road earlier. These are people that are farmers. These are tough people that live out you know, in these sparse areas that have seen every kind of creature. And they're terrified. 
you know, guys that, you know, have properties and, you know, walk through the dark all the time are now running from their truck to the house because something's coming after them and they know what they saw. And so, but when other people come around, these things seem to have a sort of a supernatural ability to kind of disappear or blend in. Another example would be Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some pretty decent, I would say, Bigfoot evidence in terms of camera. And of course, everybody says it's CGI or whatever. And maybe a lot of it is. But these things seem to like disappear almost. That speaks of a supernatural type creature that might be able to morph or blend in. And, you know, does that sound crazy? Well, ask our Native American friends. You know what they can call a skinwalker that's kind of a shapeshifter. Mm-hmm. You know, and if if you if you get bored, YouTube <laughs> shapeshifters, YouTube, there's one, there's one that I could think of where this creature is like standing on this rock and this guy's filming it, and it looks like one thing, and then when it falls off the rock, it looks like something totally different. Uh, they've scrutinized that video. There's nothing CGI about it. It mm-hmm. this thing turns into something else right on camera. And so when you think of that you think that's probably what this is. Now, the thing to know is, is this, regardless of what it is, like Roy said, this is evil. This is not natural. Mm -hmm. This is not a bear that's hungry and is tracking a human down and eats them. That's tragic, but that's nature. That is a bear being a bear. But this dog man that's standing behind this cabin My question to you, Tony, if you are listening, and I apologize, it took a handful of weeks to get to your letter, and I hope you're, hope you're going to hear this episode and I can even send you an email a little bit later to tell you it's going to be on there. But my question to you is, was there anything going on in your life? I know it was COVID and I know you guys went to the woods to kind of get some fresh air, but were you running from something? Were you hiding from something? Was there a spiritual crisis in your life? Mm -hmm. Was there, you know, a sadness or depression or an anger and, and please don't hear judgment in me, but was there some sort of sin that you were wrestling with? Because it didn't come for your friend, Tony, it came for you. It didn't wait till you went to the restroom and show itself to your friend. It showed itself to you. And when your friend came out, it actually disappeared. I don't doubt that you saw something and Mm -hmm. I, and I believe you, my friend, I believe you with my whole heart. And Melissa's looking at the screen right now. She's looking at this email. Do you see anything in this email that would indicate Mm -mm. that he's making up a story here? And when he said he felt it, like the hair stood up on the back of his neck before he saw it. And you can tell like when bad energy is, is there or some evil intent. I I love that, Melissa, because, you know, we, we were told things when we were young, like trust your instincts, Thanks. right? Mm-hmm. But then what we do in those moments is we don't <laughs> trust our instincts, right? So we're in the house, everything's fine. It seems like it got darker and your hair stands on your end and we go, oh, I oh, must see. be imagining. <laughs> we actually don't trust our instincts because I think there's that little part of us that says, I don't want my instincts to be right. Your youngest daughter, when we're together, is so funny. We're always telling like different stories or <clears throat> she's telling me a story about her friends. And she would always say, if you ever start running, I'm running right behind you and I'll catch up and I'll ask you why you're running later. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. And so like, like Tony, as you, as you hear us talking, like you trust your instincts and my, my words to you or is that you pray Mm -hmm. that you ask God to reveal what was going on in your life, even if you're not really sure. Now, when I say things like that, a lot of people can get offended because they feel like I'm being judgmental, but I'm really not. What I'm doing is being honest. If it makes you feel any better, I'm a sinner. I probably sinned 40 times today. And if people tell you they didn't, they're liars. And that's a sin in and of itself. We all fall sin and fall short. So it's not about I'm better than you or my life is in order or whatever. There could be other reasons. It could have been some sort of a sign of a demon that's maybe wants to mess with one of your family members and it was coming to you to kind of get you off of your prayer uh, Mm -hmm. regimen so it can go attack your family and you become ineffective. So there's reasons that these things will manifest to us. 
Uh, most of the time, though, it's because they're after us. Most of the time, it's because they have an agenda and they have been subtly kind of working in till by the time they show themselves to us, we're usually pretty far down the road. And so my question to Roy on These Woods Are Haunted episode uh, you know, three of season three would be, what was going on in your life? He doesn't tell that part of the story, but he does say that he uprooted himself from Nebraska and he didn't know a lot of people and he was mm -hmm. working at this store. So a lot of times these things are simply just like change mm -hmm. and we become weak in our spirits. And, you know, it's real easy to not pray when you're busy or when life is changing and, you know, you don't find a new church right away or you don't find you know, a new prayer time right away, your schedule changes and used to pray, used to get up at five 30 and pray till six. Then you got in the shower and now your new job starts a half hour earlier. So what's the easiest thing to cut Yeah, is your prayer time. Mm -hmm. And so those are the types of things that we can catch ourselves if we're not careful, um, you know, opening ourselves up to these attacks that are constantly in the works. And I, I'm going to kind of say that as we kind of start to wrap up here, we are always under attack. I think what we do a lot of times is we say, well, I was under attack three weeks ago, but now I'm good. Well, it's not that the attack has gone. It's just that you might have a reprieve or God may be kind of giving you a little extra protection to let you kind of build your strength up before the attack gets his second or third, you know, momentum because demons don't want to leave you alone. They want mm -hmm. to destroy you, kill, steal, and destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10 is something that you should read often, have memorized. Ephesians chapter six, where it says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but of principalities, of powers, of rulers, of darkness. There are, there are, entities there are powers that are beyond our sight that are constantly trying to destroy us and so ephesians 6 when it tells you to put on the armor of god that's not like a one time thing because at that point in the you know the first century you know uh you know hebrew culture was something that was going on specifically for them that's for us for all time and so putting on the armor of God, and, and I would encourage you to read through Ephesians 6 if, 6 if you do not know what I'm talking about, and understand what that is truly saying. It's teaching you about the ways to fight spiritual battles. And so when I look at Roy and I look at Tony in this letter, that's where you start. But you're not crazy. Mm -hmm. There are creatures on this earth that we can understand. Now, I can get to heaven and God could go, man, you were really teaching that stuff, but you had no idea what you were talking about. The dog man was actually this creature. And I would say, God, I did my best. And he'd say, you did. And at least what you did is you pointed them to me mm -hmm. and let me give them the answer. Now, I'm going to tell you something crazy that a crazy friend of mine told me once upon a time that I still think about. And this is one of those guys, Melissa, and you haven't met him yet and probably will one day. He's a very old, wise man. I mean, like, you know, those 200 IQ genius people that are so weird and please, if you're, if I have a pretty high IQ, but not like that. If you're one of those, I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm not trying to, to make fun of you, but I'm just saying this guy is one of those guys that's so smart. He's pretty awkward. One day we were on this topic and this was years ago you know, because he would kind of, he kind of was intrigued by me that I would go out and pray for these demons with people. And he even went with me a couple of times because he was so logical that he believed it logically, but he had never seen anything tangibly. So he went, we actually prayed deliverance over this family and I took him back home and he asked me to come upstairs for a while. And I think we ate some leftovers or something. And he told me, I'm going to give you one of my theories. And I said, no go for boy. it. <laughs> he said, I think that Bigfoot is Cain. And I said, what? And he said, think about it. The Bible says that God put a mark on Cain so that anybody who came in contact, him, contact with him wouldn't kill him. So God basically, you know, Cain killed his brother Abel 
and then Cain was put out like out of the community basically, but he was marked. So nobody would go and take revenge on him. Mm-hmm. Well, and I'm like, okay, Steve, what are you saying? And he's like, well, what if the mark wasn't like a tattoo or what if it wasn't like a scar, but what if he marked him with hair mm-hmm. and he's, cur- the Bible says that he's cursed to roam the earth. And somehow in the flood, because he could not be killed, he somehow survived the flood and he's the one that walks around. And that's why you see him all over the planet because he's cursed to wander. And why am I telling this story? Uh, yeah, well, there's no evidence. There's no bones. There's no DNA. Yeah. <laughs> now, listeners, please hear me. I don't think that's true. But what I am saying is, is I can't prove that it's not true. Mm-hmm. But Steve, being the good Christian man that he is, has an answer. (laughs) He has an answer for what Bigfoot is. You know, I look at a story like Jacob and Esau in the Bible. And if you don't know the story, you know, Jacob is their twins. But what happens is, is there's this wrestling in the womb where Jacob's limb came out first, but then he went back in and Esau came out literally in whole first, and then Jacob came out second. So on paper, Esau was the firstborn. But Esau was this kind of crazy guy who gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup. And and Jacob was able to deceive his father, Isaac, by putting all this sheepskin on his arms and smelling like game, like smelling like a wild animal. Mm -hmm. So when Isaac, who was blind, wanted to give the blessing to his son before he died. Jacob pretended to be Esau. And Isaac even says, well, you know, it kind of sounds like Jacob, but I felt your arms. You must be Esau. So here's the blessing. And so when Esau comes back and finds out that Jacob stole his blessing, and by the way, Jacob, God changed his name to Israel, which is where we get the Israelites from. But when he was still Jacob, He had to flee because Esau was going to kill him. But we hear that story a thousand times in the Bible, but none of us says, who's so hairy? Who's so red, (laughs) red, hairy guy, like reddish, hairy guy that could be so hairy that I could put a sheepskin on my arm and somebody would think it was me. Yeah. Like Melissa jokes with me that I'm not a very hairy man. (laughs) Like I, I have real fine hair on my arms and legs. I'm not, which I, I'm actually proud of. Exactly. If I was one of those guys with hair on my back, I don't know how I would live. So, but this is like literally the opposite. And how does somebody become like that? Well, if you know, if you understand, you know, the, the biblical history, we don't call these people the Esauites. The descendants of Esau are not the Esauites. They're the Edomites. So Esau became Edom. And just like a lot of other creatures, or I should say a lot of other people that I believe became Mm creature-like through these rituals that somehow occurred after the flood, they developed this tainted DNA again. They become these different types of beings, these different types of creatures, human-like I believe that Esau was one of those because picture in your mind, it doesn't say that he was a hairy, red haired guy. He was so hairy that a sheep's wool on his arm is what he felt like. That's, that's like more than a genetic Genetic. defect, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so, wow, that sounds like a Bigfoot to me. Hmm. Esau sounds like a Bigfoot to me. Now, was I there? No. Would I, would I fight you in a, in a biblical, you know, grudge match in a, in a cage of, <laughs> in a, at the undercard for the UFC over that? Of course not. But I would encourage you to give me an alternate explanation for what Esau was to be that hairy. Yeah. Because you, you can, you know, I think of like those people that are like in the, in the, what do you call it? The sideshows mm-hmm. where they're like the bearded lady and stuff. But I have never seen one so hairy that you would think that sheep's wool or goat's wool was a person. And so I would challenge you to say that Esau was probably a Bigfoot. 
at least what we would consider a Bigfoot like creature. Mm -hmm. And so that would make more sense to me that he went through one of these rituals and why God allowed oh. Jacob to become the chosen, mm -hmm. where that line of people were chosen to be God's people because God could not allow Esau's tainted blood oh. to be the chosen people that came from Isaac, from Abraham, his son Isaac, and then down to Jacob. Now, again, that's a lot of theology. It's a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, speculation, but it, I think it comes that conjecture comes from a place of, you know, kind of prove me wrong by, by giving me the alternative that makes more sense. Mm -hmm. The only other alternative you have as a Christian, or even somebody who's pursuing this in an academic, give me the alternative explanations because the only alternative you have is those stories aren't true. And that's a cop out to me, mm -hmm. you know, especially as a believer, you know, if you believe that Abraham took Isaac up to a mountain and was going to sacrifice him and God stopped it to see if Abraham really was faithful with giving his children to God. And so God sparing Isaac and then Isaac being the father of what would be Israel. Mm -hmm. Why would God not let Jacob come out of the womb first? Like he tried to, mm -hmm. why would God allow him to be the second born, but then somehow take the blessing from Isaac unless that was because Esau Edom can't have the blessing because mm -hmm. he's tainted. That makes more sense to me. Now, Melissa, is that too theological or would we rather just hear Roy tell stories about a werewolf? <laughs> no, I say both. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I so, like the way you explain that. That's... Well, I appreciate that. I, 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 I think you're with it. I, mean, I can see it. I can like see it in as like a movie. Like it totally makes sense. And, and like from the Bible, like you said, yeah. So you're in radio, they call this an ombudsman. <laughs> so you have somebody that's kind of sitting next to you going, okay, you're getting a little crazy. So that's why I always <laughs> turn to Melissa and say that. And I would, I would say that as we close, a lot of you that read the Bible and say that it's boring. I don't think you've learned to read it in picture form. Like Melissa yeah. just said, when you read a story of, of a lady named Ruth, who is goes through these tragedies and gets moved to another place and, and has to struggle, you know, to, to regain some semblance of her womanhood back. And, you know, you, when you read the story of Ruth in the Bible, do you read it with a picture in your mind? Do you read it with her having to make a decision on where she was going to spend the rest of her life? And I, and, and I'm just using that out, just out of the air as an example because if not, you know, some people could say, well, that story's kind of boring. Well, no, it's not. Yeah. If, if you put a picture to it, even the story of, you know, of like, um, let, let's say, for example, the story of Moses in Egypt, you know, t begging Pharaoh to let his people go or demanding, I should say, that Pharaoh let his people go. You know, we've watched these movies with like Charlton Heston when we uh -huh. were young, <laughs> but you watch these movies about this but we've, we've put too much Hollywood to it. Mm -hmm. When you read that story, picture what it would be like to be this guy, Moses, who grew up in this palace, this Egyptian palace as royalty, and then having to flee to go live in the literal wilderness mm -hmm. and become like a, like a laborer, uh -huh. like a shepherd. And then all of a sudden God comes to you mm -hmm. in a burning bush, a bush that will not burn out and talks to you and says, you're going to go back. Don't worry. Those people that wanted to kill you are dead, but you're going to go back and you're going to approach Pharaoh, your dirty self. You're not the old made up Egyptian guy mm -hmm. anymore. And you're going to go tell him to let my people go. Put yourself in Moses's shoes. And right. you're a stutter. So, yeah. It says Moses didn't talk well. So that's why Aaron spoke for him, but he had to go Picture him stuttering like Pharaoh. Hey, you, you, you need to let my, my people go. Like, do you think of it that way? Or do you just go, oh, I've heard that story a thousand times. A thousand times. times yeah. So what I would encourage you to do is go back to your scriptures this week and read the story of King Og of Bashan and see if you read it different. See if you can understand what we're saying about how these Nephilim continued somehow after the flood and start to put these pieces together because you might meet a Tony one day who says, 
hey, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, but this happened to me, what should I do? Well, of course, the answer is we need to pray. And so we're going to pray for Tony tonight, and we're going to pray for all of you as well. And uh, But before we do that, anything we miss, Melissa, or anything you want to throw in about uh, dogmen or werewolves or other cryptids? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Actually, this is probably the first time I don't have anything. But I'm glad that Tony... Uh, wrote in and told his story. And like you said, it was in 2020 and now we're in 24. So this is something that's still in the back of his mind, just like Roy, um, you know, in, in the episode that we saw, like they still struggle with, I would be terrified to this day if I saw something like that, especially to make your hair stand up on the back of your neck and then you see it and it's looking directly at you, you know, eye to eye. This was like me turning around and looking at you in the eye, I can't imagine seeing something like that and have to have that memory. But I'm just thankful that nothing happened to Tony as far as physical, but emotionally and spiritually is something he's still struggling with that he, you know, wrote this letter. So hopefully. Sure. And know, then, and then imagine not a, being believed on not top being of believed. it. You're haunted and don't know where to go. So mm -hmm. Um, our, our cryptids are sitting at our feet, starting to stir. So we're going to say a prayer and end this podcast. I say cryptids because they're, <laughs> they're both mixed, mixed breed dogs. Um, but, uh, let's pray. Heavenly father, I just thank you so much for Tony and his willingness to write in and broach a difficult subject. I, I, I can imagine what it's like to not know where to go with something like this, because we Christians, God, we believe that we know everything. And if people don't broach a subject the right way, or they don't believe as we believe, we tend to be judgmental. So God, I pray for Tony. I pray that his nightmares would cease if they haven't already. I pray that you would give him a peace of mind to know that it was you that was protecting him the whole time. Mm -hmm. And that all those, these things come to us and try to scare us and get us to feed them our negative energy that God, you you are someone who has defeated this foe, that you're someone who has, has understood this in a way that we never did. You looked down on your creation and saw these watchers and these humans just become so vile and so untrusting of you that they try to become gods themselves. They try to alter DNA and, and go against your will, God. But I pray that we myself included, Melissa included, Tony included, that we would just be able to continue to surrender our will to you, that we would not want to be God, but that we would understand that we serve the omnipotent, almighty God who has nothing but our best interest in mind. You love us, God. You will always be there for us. You will never leave us or forsake us, and that we only have to turn to you. I pray, God, for anybody who's listening to this podcast that they would be able to um, find solace in you, that any paranormal activity that's going on, that you would get them to the right people, whether that's by writing into us or whether that's going to a church, just get them to people that will believe them and to be able to pray with them. And if necessary, pray deliverance over them so that they could be free of these bonds of these demons that just want to destroy us and that are so cunning and crafty that they wiggle their way in. God, we love you, we trust in you, and we believe that you are the Savior, not just for our eternity, but our Savior every day from the attacks of the enemy. God, thank you so much for uh, the people that will write in in the future. I just pray for them in advance that they would not only have the courage, but the ability to write in, talk to us about this, and that know that we will be there for them and that we will believe them. We, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to thank you again and just remind you that word of mouth is always the best way for us to grow this podcast, to be able to help those uh, that need it. So if you know somebody who's struggling or you yourself are struggling with some sort of a spiritual warfare type issue, please write anthony at the struggle series.com and uh, just send us some preliminary information. We'll spark up a conversation with you and we'll do everything we can to get you the help that you need. In addition, if you enjoy this content and you want something from a more fictional standpoint, but still covers these crazy topics that we cover like the one today, 
You can always listen to our second podcast, which is called the struggle series, where we outline uh, my works, the trilogy of books called the struggle series. And uh, you can listen to those wherever you're listening to this podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Melissa, again, for being here. We're loving to have you. (laughs) Um, And we just continue to have more fun. And last but not least, we have a very exciting episode coming up next week where we're going to have uh, some friends of ours who have their own podcast. We're going to come and talk about some of their paranormal activity. So I won't spill the beans on who they Mm -hmm. are, but uh, (laughs) next week's episode is going to be one that's fun, a lot of laughter and some crazy paranormal stories and something that they're going to bring to me that I had never known before that uh, actually kind of taught me something. So we're all going to learn together. Thanks again for joining us and may God bless you and bring you peace.